Hello and welcome everybody. In this series of videos we are going to discuss Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. This is one of the main topics of the book and it will take a bit of space, so this series consists of six videos. And what we learn is Markov chain Monte Carlo methods are methods for obtaining Monte Carlo estimates, but the Markov chain mechanism provides some way of generating the random samples. There will be a recipe for that. That will be the Metropolis Hastings algorithm. And since for these methods you don't need to worry anymore about how you generate your random numbers, these methods are quite popular and they are widely used in practice. Okay, so let's jump straight in. We will discuss Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. Markov chain Monte Carlo, because it's a bit of a mouthful, is commonly abbreviated as MCMC, and chances are you have probably seen the abbreviation MCMC already. So MCMC methods is what we are going to discuss in this chapter. And I want to start by pointing out a slight conflict in notation, namely in this abbreviation we used MC as a shorthand for Markov chain, but we also used MC as a shorthand for Monte Carlo. And these are the two ingredients of the method. And unfortunately, or I'm not sure whether it's unfortunate, but definitely they have the same initial letters, but there will never be an actual conflict in the sense that you couldn't work it out easily. And in particular in MC, MC, we have both, so it is clear. It must, one must be Markov chain, one must be Monte Carlo. So let's remember what these things are. So Markov chains are a class of stochastic processes. We denoted them by xj. So that gives us xj where j is an n, maybe n0, which is a stochastic process. And Monte Carlo estimates, we have also already discussed. These are estimates of the form zn equals 1 over n sum j from 1 to n f of xj. And originally these xj were iid random variables, independent and identically distributed. And the new thing for a Markov chain Monte Carlo estimate is that instead of iid samples, we will plug in the xj from a Markov chain. So these go here. And our aim in this chapter is to understand first why this is a valid thing to do. Again, we used that these were IID before, now they are no longer, now they are a Markov chain. So we need to see what's the effect of this difference. And then when we discussed Monte Carlo estimates, we spent much time discussing the error. So we will need to think of, in particular, when we discuss the difference, what happens to the error in this case. So I pop an MC, MC here, because the estimator stays the same, and that is still an estimator for the expectation of f of x. But there are many details we need to discuss, because the xj, even if the estimator looks similar, are now a different thing. So this is our estimator. First, there is the kind of obvious question, how do the xj here relate to the x? Before, when we just did Monte Carlo estimates, we said each of the xj has the same distribution as x does. And it will turn out that we will need to relax a bit. So xj will form a Markov chain. I write mc here. It's a process, so it can only mean Markov chain. It cannot possibly mean Monte Carlo here. xj, a Markov chain with the distribution of x as the stationary distribution. And in section 4.1, the first section in this chapter, we will see how to get such a Markov chain. So section 4.1 explains how to get such a Markov chain. And again, I write MC. The word Monte Carlo would make no sense at all in this place, so it must mean Markov chain. And then once we have this, we know already the XJ in the Markov chain are not independent. They are a bit dependent, namely xj can depend on the past, but only via the previous step. So it is kind of a restricted dependence. So we are still somewhat close to iid, but we are definitely not independent anymore. So we will need to think what will happen to the error that will be affected by this dependence. And that we will discuss in section 4.2. So that is the plan. Section 4.1 we will see how to get such Markov chain, and we just have to trust that that will do something good in the end. 
And then in section 4.2, we will learn what is the effect of replacing independent samples with a Markov chain, and we will also need to discuss why do we do that. So let's proceed in steps. We will get to the why and why does it work in a little while. So in this series of videos, we will focus on section 4.1, where we will learn how to generate such a Markov chain. And now we know the requirement. We need to be able to construct a Markov chain for a given stationary distribution. And that is the opposite way around, then you may have learned that in a Markov chain module. And if you do a module about Markov chains, you will learn for a given Markov chain to determine what is the stationary distribution. And we learned a bit about this in section 2.3. But here we need to do the somewhat unusual reverse. Namely, we need to work out given a distribution, the distribution of x, how do we find a Markov chain which has this distribution as its stationary distribution? And we will do this here using something called the Metropolis Hastings algorithm. So let's see how that is done. The algorithm comes in two forms to go with the two discussions we had about Markov chains, namely there is one form for discrete state space, if x takes only a discrete set of values, and there is a separate version for continuous state space, so if x comes from some continuous distribution, and as before, these versions will mostly differ in notation, and I'm going to mostly focus on the discrete version. So let's see what we have. So discrete version is where we assume x takes values in a discrete set S. For example, S could be the integers if x is something like binomial or geometric distributed. And let pi be the distribution of x, so that we have pi of x is the probability of x being equal to little x for all x in S. So in this case, our aim is find a Markov chain with stationary distribution pi. So we need to find a Markov chain with stationary distribution pi. That's our aim. And now let's go through the steps of the algorithm first. And then once we have the algorithm written down, we will bit by bit discuss all the things we need to learn about it. So we need to describe how are the xj constructed given pi. And the first thing, x0 is not really described by the algorithm. We just get to pick somehow. And here I just try to choose x0 in S. There's only one constraint, pi of x0 must be positive. That means x0 must be one of the values which x actually can take. So if we have a random variable like Poisson, which takes positive values, then we cannot choose x0 equal to minus 1, because that is not a positive value of x, so pi of minus 1 would be 0, but we can choose any positive number, because for Poisson they all have positive probability. Then we need to construct the next steps, and for a Markov chain we do that step by step. So for j equals 1 to 3 and so on, we will always construct xj from xj minus 1. So if j is 1, we will use x0 and some extra randomness I'm going to talk about to construct x1, and so on. And the process will involve pi to make sure that we will check this later, pi will be a stationary distribution. The method itself is a bit like rejection sampling, so we first generate a proposal, which I want to call yj, such that probability of yj equal to a given value little y equals p xj minus 1 y where little p are the elements of some transition matrix, which we still need to discuss. So for now, let's just pin that down what we need. So we need a transition matrix, I call the matrix itself capital P, and the elements I call little p x y, where x and y are in s. So we need to still choose this, but that will be a transition matrix. And if you look at this expression, that just means make one step according to the transition matrix starting at xj minus 1. So we take the previous state of the Markov chain for the row index. Then since p is a transition matrix, we know that's a complete set of probabilities as a function of y. They are positive and add up to 1. So we can specify the distribution of yj by saying we take a row of the transition matrix and then we just pick one of the elements of s with the probabilities given by the transition matrix. So that makes sense. That's the proposal. And as for rejection sampling, we have some accept reject mechanism. And for that, we use an auxiliary variable uj, which again, for simplicity, will be assumed to be standard uniform. 
and then xj the next step of the markov chain we want to define will be either the proposal yj or if we reject we just take the previous step so it may be xj minus one and that happens with some probability alpha so if uj is less than or equal to alpha we accept and take the proposal and otherwise we reject and keep the old value and the acceptance probability depends on the old value so xj minus one and the proposal so yj and there is a formula for alpha alpha xy the probability of accepting a step from x to y equals pi y py x divided pi x pxy and here pi is the target probability distribution so pi is what we want and if you look that's the first time we have used pi that so goes in here and there and it also uses this transition matrix p here we have pyx and down here we have pxy so that's two elements from the transition matrix and there's just one modification needed namely that thing could be larger than one and if i want alpha to be a probability then turns out the right thing to do here is to take the minimum of that and one so that is the definition of alpha and with this we have at least written down all steps of the algorithm so let's just go through it once more very quickly we start somewhere we get to choose that's not specified by the algorithm and we'll later see it's not so important how we choose as long as we have this condition satisfied then in each step we do some accept reject thing where we first generate a proposal using this transition matrix p which we haven't discussed really yet but which we will need to perform the algorithm and it turns out you can choose any p but there are good and bad p's for efficiency so correctness is fine you can use any p efficiency may be affected if you choose a bad p we'll discuss this later then we generate our u just to help us to decide whether to accept or reject this choice here means accept with probability alpha reject otherwise and here different from rejection sampling if we reject we do not start over but instead we just stay with the old value and the probability we will need to actually perform that algorithm that's called alpha and the probability of accepting a step from x to y is minimum of pi of y py x over pi of x pxy with one good so these are the steps of the discrete version of the algorithm before we go on i want to also write the continuous version for comparison as i already mentioned that differs mostly in notation where we need now to use densities instead of probabilities so let me just write this down this version of the algorithm instead of the probabilities pi we will need a density pi so we assume probability of x in a equals integral over a pi of x dx which means pi is the density of the distribution of x then next we get to choose x0 again but this time pi is a density so the density evaluated x0 needs to be positive that corresponds to this line and now we do our steps with the accept reject so for j starting at one what we do is we generate our proposal yj from p x j minus one where this p is a transition density which means two things first thing p x y is greater or equal to zero for all x and y and s and second thing like for the transition matrix the rows sum to one here if we do integral p of x y dy then this needs to be equal to one for all x in s the logic being that p x y as a function of y is the density of the next step assuming we are currently in x these two things i have written here are the definition of a density so densities are positive and integrate to one and that's now as a function of y and the x is an extra argument which says where do we come from this is how we use it here so this dot i just mean look at it as a function still and this twiddle means choose y from this density where we have already plugged in the previous step and are now left over with the density as a function of the second argument so that is the continuous version of this where we choose y again we fix the row where we come from and then we chose the probabilities at this case is for the given previous step and here we chose the density for the given previous step the next line is unchanged 
generate UJ standard uniform. That is for making the decision whether to accept or reject. And then XJ is either the proposal YJ or the previous state XJ minus one. And you can guess if you remember the previous slide. So if UJ is less than or equal to alpha, so with probability alpha, we take the proposal and otherwise we reject the proposal and the alpha again depends on the previous state and the proposal and the formula you can guess in analogy again. So the probability of accepting a proposal from X to Y is, is again this minimum of pi of Y, that's now a function, P Y X, that's now a function, and the denominator is pi of X, P X Y, and then the minimum is between this and one. So if you compare it to the formula here, you'll see that in direct analogy, only these probabilities here have been replaced with densities here. So again, we have seen all steps of the algorithm. And again, we need to change some transition mechanism. So here we need to choose a transition matrix. Here we need to choose a transition density. And again, this choice will affect efficiency, but not so much correctness. With this, we have learned about the general form of the Metropolis Hastings algorithm. But so far, we have just covered the basics. And our next task is to understand that a bit more in depth and to learn how that can be used to actually compute Markov chain Monte Carlo estimates. And we'll start this process in the next video by considering an example. So see you there.